welcome to episode six of the Grand Trace Bros podcast. It's been a long time since we've joined you guys to inform you on the what's and how's of Gran Turismo, but we're back and we have more people than ever. One, not two, but three, if you can count them as a person. His name is Daniel Lamb. No, it's the, <laughs> Daniel Solis, sorry. <laughs> All these PSN games have me all messed up, but yes, we are here. Get used to it, all right? I'll give you a pass on that one. We have <laughs> FIA World Tour 2019. We have the FIA Online World, well, the FIA Championship for 2019. We got uh, car news. We have Toyotas, and we have the beautiful Tristan Bayless. Hello. As my co-host and our guest for the hour, or whatever, how long, however long this takes, uh, Daniel Solis, Dodge Lamb, as you may know, the uh, fightinest controller user in the world, according to my humble estimation. estimation. Welcome to the show, Daniel. How are you doing today? I don't know if I'm happy to be here after everything you just said, <laughs> but we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. Uh, nothing like a, like an upset Daniel to start the day. Hmm. My favorite. But You'll yes. do fine. Dude. I'm always your favorite. Oh, you are. You are. The things you tell me, every day. Sometimes <laughs> oh I get God. a little worried. <laughs> <laughs> I do too. You might like me a little too much. Well, I feel very comfortable, you know. So I'll be sending you stuff in the mail. Just uh, don't worry about it. Yeah, dude. It's nice that you're approachable about any topic. Yeah get down and serious about things you and that's one of the things i wanted to mention first of all is uh, your knowledge you know it's vinicius or also known as hell's fire and dodge lamb you two are the ones that i'm always like what are, i want something just happened in the gt world and i want to know what these two guys think so i can form my opinion after that hmm. i'm a man of hot takes so you shouldn't listen to me well yeah, they're hot takes. They may not be right right away, but they're, they're interesting. They they they, sh- they rattle the nest, so to speak. So. You're like a, a boiling cauldron of current events. <laughs> yeah, dude. And that should taste like tofu, too. That's not a good thing. <laughs> no, to not tofu, sorry. Uh, fondue. Ugh. It's been a while. We're still anyway. heading in the wrong direction here. <laughs> we are. Let's bring it on back. I'm supposed to be the host. I'm the moderator. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So... Starting off with the event that just happened today. We're recording on a Saturday. It is March 16th. The World Tour Nations Cup just happened. I'm sorry, Manufacturers Cup just happened. Nations is tomorrow. And some of us watched it. So what do you guys think, starting with Tristan? It was extremely exciting the whole time. Um, I was on the edge of my seat for, gosh, like three out of four races. And even then, the um, every race had uh, a lot of punctuated moments of, um, you know, exceptional driving, opportunistic overtaking, and then just ridiculous calamity. So, uh, without spoiling anything, I gotta say it's absolutely worth a watch for even casual viewers. Yeah. Oh, we're fine to spoil. This is a spoiler cast, but thank you for that. Before we get into the spoilers, now's the time if you guys want to fast forward onto the other juicy news we're gonna we're gonna cover toward the end of the podcast. Which, that being the uh, ju- recently released uh, Gran Turismo FIA World Championship Series Overview. We're going to be talking about that in the uh, second half of the podcast. So, fast forward if you don't want any spoilers for the World Tour uh, manufacturers. All right. And Paris. Paris. Number one. And there were short races, weren't they, Daniel? They were uh, uh, sprints, like true sprints. Yeah, they were... I think a little bit shorter than most people wanted. Like, even the final race, 17 laps at Barcelona is not too particularly long. Uh, certainly wasn't like, I guess Nürburgring wasn't even that long either, but, <clears throat> you know, you're expecting a longer event, you know? If they're going to dedicate an entire day to uh, uh, an, a specific series, probably want more than 32 laps overall over the course of four races. Hmm. It didn't give too much time for people to make up any ground that that was lost, etc. Because there were quite a few mistakes. Uh, some warranted, some unwarranted. 
but there were there were definitely some costly mistakes that in a longer race wouldn't have been so bad but a lot of the championship was somewhat decided on one uh the winners playing super well and then two a lot of other people getting screwed over by either small or major mistakes from themselves or from other people so uh i wish it was longer just to allow people to fight a little bit more but it is what it is so who's the first guy in your mind that got screwed over in this world tour who got screwed over there were a lot of people so um i think the one that got hurt the most was the Renault drivers they the big spin they had at brands hatch sent them all the way from second to last place and of course that set them up for a really tough climb back to the top from the second race onward yeah, totally. That was very, uh, gosh, huge penalty for what happens. Well, when you think uh, when you think of Renault, at least nowadays, you don't really think of uh, in terms of Group Four, the the, the McGann itself. The usually the McGann Trophy is what's used in the meta. So, the first thing that shot to my mind was the Renault driver just spun from second all the way down to last. They're going to get no points for the first race. And then there is the potential that they get stuck with the McGann Trophy at Tokyo. Thankfully, they didn't. But had they had they gotten the trophy for the second race, they might have stayed in 12th place. Mm-hmm. Going into the third race, being dead last, having to catch up through Suzuka, which I guess wouldn't have been too bad considering what happened there. But mm-hmm. it was... It was about to be really bad for them if they didn't get saved by having the better McGann for Tokyo. But I think Renault, they did so well to make up what they had lost, but it just, it wasn't enough for them because the mistakes they had were way too crucial. Where did they finish at Suzuka? Were they on the podium? They won. Oh, damn. Duh. (laughs) They uh, They went last in the first race up to fifth at Tokyo and the McGann, and then they won Suzuka, and I, they were 11th in the final race because of that botched pitch strategy. Yeah. Or it wasn't even a botched pitch strategy. It was just an honest mistake. That was too bad. I guess yeah. I, was, uh, I was paying more attention in my memory to um, Marzan in the Mercedes at Suzuka. It's like the camera was always on you him. You mean so. the part where everybody bullied him? <laughs> yes. <laughs> everybody bullied him, and then he got a five-second penalty for something that happened off screen. You're... So it was just like, y- you couldn't have a more depressing race. Welcome to Gran Turismo Finals, bro. Yeah. It was like you know, I'm not. I'm not going to speak for the stewarding, but <laughs> he got hit What's so many stewarding? times on the cameras. It was hilarious. There and was some... to end up with a five-second penalty at the very end for something that we didn't get to see, it was just like... Uh Uh-oh, what is going on here? Yeah. I felt really bad for him. He resisted a lot of it for a while. He was driving really well. Well, so... Yeah, he was actually doing well. People that don't know, Marzan uh, was actually a substitute for uh, Nick McMillan, who uh, had a decline because he couldn't be at Paris. But uh, Marzan, you know, he came through for Mercedes. He was pretty... A lot of people said he did pretty well for himself. And the team. Would you guys agree? Yeah, Mercedes did pretty well. I think. Uh, <clears throat> I think Mercedes didn't have the best car for the tracks. I think the Group Four race at Tokyo was their best shot to score big points, and they got away with what fourth place, and then that's where Marzan was set up to defend from everybody in the Suzuka race. But you know, for Mercedes being a very like consistent all-around group three car that's very good at what it does uh just the the tracks that it got brands hatch i think the the most important thing to note was that besides tokyo which was the group four race which you know group four nobody even cares about uh the group three races in particular were pretty handling heavy circuits so it never really got a chance to shine yeah i think you can make a case for Renault having a very having a better showing than it would have had otherwise because the tracks were so favorable toward the RSL one. Right. 
but Mercedes didn't have that that luck in the track selection. I think again it was a good all round car for the tracks, but I think there were other cars that were able to utilize the tracks better. Yeah. For sure. So the performance was good. I don't think the circumstances were as good for them. And then of course the Suzuka incident didn't help. Mm. Were you disappointed they didn't use Atopolis? I was kind of disappointed. I was disappointed, but I can kind of understand because it's such a, a low prep time. But, I mean, I guess they've done that before, so it's it wouldn't have been the biggest deal. Right. No worse Autopolis is a, is a fun track, too. So Totally. It's, I, I like it a lot as well. Yeah. Uh, but in terms of cars that didn't work, though, I think the biggest one was Toyota. I'm actually baffled as to why they ended... I mean, I guess with the Toyota partnership, it makes sense to use the new Supra. But the FT1 was so much better for pretty much every track, and they ended up with the Supra instead. I think if Toyota had the FT1, they would have done a whole lot better. Yeah. Because it has it's better on its tires as well, right? It's really good on tires, and it's really good on cornering. And every single track there for the Group 3 cars were pretty handling-oriented. Yeah. It's crazy good at cornering. Yeah, it was it was very disappointing that they were left with the Super instead of the FT1 because if they had the FT1, they probably would have been a a championship contending team right there. For sure, classic Toyota move. Yep. If I'm honest, <laughs> but uh, the so speaking of stand-ins, we obviously were just talking about Marzen coming in for McMillan off for Mercedes, and then Marcel or this is Ridic Olus. How do you say it, Daniel? I don't know. We might as well just call him ridiculous <laughs> at this point. It's ridiculous. This is this ridiculous. is ridiculous. <laughs> and he's the story of the day of the uh, manufacturer round one world tour uh, series or whatever. Stop. Because <laughs> uh, yeah, he came out of nowhere. He was a wild card. He was fourth pick, uh, fourth substitute. I believe. Third. I believe Anisha said that he was the fourth reserve driver for Aston in terms of points. Yeah. There were a lot of reserve drivers, I think. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah, but like within... Castro. Like within Aston Martin itself, I believe. Right. could be wrong on that, though. For American reason. Because it was supposed to be Hendrix. (coughs) Correct. Hendrix was originally... He was the one that went to Monaco. Yep. And so Marcel... uh, or this is he's that's his last name. Um, this is ridiculous. Came in for him and did really well. He actually surprised everyone, which was awesome to see. And uh, obligatory USA chant, which I'll do later. <laughs> um, Castro, Richard Castro, our boy, our knight and shining PS2, is uh, coming in for Terrell or uh, Meadows, yes, and uh, Lexus. So he's on the championship team. It's a big, uh, it's a big spot to, to fill, and I think uh, what would you, uh, how did how did he do, or how did the team fare this time around? I think they had a few decent races. Um, I think um, originally it was supposed to be uh, not Group Four, right, at uh, Tokyo. And then it switched. It was yeah, it was going to be three, it. which would have been better for them. Maybe maybe the they found the curves were too hazardous and cars were flying left and right or something on Group Three. Yeah, who's testing these things? We still don't really know. <laughs> I guess <clears throat> I think it has less to do with the track and more the fact that because manufacturers is specifically a, like a two class system in terms of Group Four and Group Three, it wouldn't make sense for them not to have a Group Four race at some point because. Uh, if you're going to qualify for these events with both categories, why would you only race one? You get what I mean? Right. So they already ran Group 3 at uh, the World Final, and then they were just about to do four races in Group 3 with no Group 4 whatsoever. So I think while most people aren't a fan of Group 4, I think it's kind of necessary for them to do it since it's part of the criteria in the manufacturer series to begin with. Yeah. So I guess I just looked at the tracks that they had and, and figured that it would be the best one to turn into a Group 4 race. True. That, that makes a lot of sense. It was yeah. probably the best... Uh, I wouldn't say, like... It's not completely balanced, but it was probably the best one in terms of balancing a race. Yeah. Because it was, like, kind of fuel-limited, right? 
or tire limited? I don't think there were limits at all. The races were so short that it didn't matter. Yeah. They had like right. 16x tire wear, but just five oh, yeah, laps, yeah, yeah. just a sprint to the end. Cool. And then we had uh, Fabian, who had to step in for Anthony Felix, uh, or Anthelicious. That's Pero Loco, a.k.a. Uh, McQueen, FT McQueen, having to come in for a uh, under-the-weather Felix which was unfortunate because he really wanted to do well for Chevy, you know, having trying to make up for the, you know, their unfortunate run at Nurburgring in Monaco last year. Unfortunately, Chevy didn't really have too too great of a showing, even though they had one of the best stand-ins they could have got. Yeah, that was too bad. Ant is like uh, the fastest guy I've ever seen in a Corvette. Yeah, he's Ant does insane. things with that car that just blows my mind every time. You know, there <clears throat> when you look at leaderboards, uh, like top ten times and stuff, you look at all these cars that kind of make sense, and then you see Ant up there, just like maybe third or fourth with the Corvette, and that, like in the sense that like a Corvette probably shouldn't be there, but he puts it up so far up high, and he's just barely off of the top spot. And it just, it gets me every time, because I can't drive that car at all. Right. It's very interesting how he can bring it really quickly. I think maybe if he was there, they might have stood a better chance, because I remember they were dead last overall, even with all of Renault's big mistakes. So, I don't know. It would have been interesting to see the dynamic that Ant would have brought to that team. It's it's a shame. Yeah. He'll, he was definitely missed, and I uh, hope he recovers well. And, you know, fortunately, it was just the World Tour stop. Uh, the only thing really counting was the overall win. Now, do we know if he actually flew out to the entire event, or did he actually stay? Yeah, he went, yeah. He went? Yeah. yeah okay, well, at least there. he's got, at least he gets to do everything else. Like, imagine. Oh, yeah. Imagine not even being able to go, like, last minute. That would suck. That would suck. Oh, uh, yeah, like, sorry, I'm sick, you can't go. <laughs> that sounds like a cop-out, but yeah. I would have gone even if I was sick. Oh, yeah, dude, I would have I'd, hit, I'd I get everybody else shit. sick. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going <laughs> to slobber and snot all over that wheel. I can say You guys are going to suffer with me. Oh, damn. Taking the team down, too. Absolutely. I like <laughs> if I go down, the ship goes down. <laughs> ship nah, can't, uh, can't go on without its captain, after all. Exactly. No, I'm... <laughs> Implying I'd ever be a captain. Hey, Daniel, you all right, man? You're bleeding from your eyes. <laughs> I'm, f- I'm fine. I'm so messed up, dude. <laughs> I got to drive this car, though, man. Yeah, it's funny how little things can affect you, but, you know, who knows? Maybe Anthony. Anthony's really stri- like a stand-up guy, so maybe he was just thinking for the team. Maybe he was like, ah, I'm only feeling like 80%. I don't want to... I don't want to go in feeling eighty percent. I want to get. I want to get these guys, you know, give them a, a better shot or whatever. I don't know. Hey, but, but you that's know all what? his business. He's he's still top of Chevy. Uh, I think it's going to be really hard for people to take them that away from him. And of course, Chevy has also gotten at least the Group Three got a recent buff, and I think that manufacturer will be. I wouldn't say like super strong, but I think they'd be able to contend going into the, uh, the stages this year. So even though we don't know what's happening with manufacturers, I think if any manufacturer were to make it, Chevy would be in the mix, and I think Ant would be the top guy for that. So I think I think he's got more shots. For sure. And that uh, brings up a little bit uh, – well, it brings to mind my run in this previous off-season exhibition uh, series that just happened. Uh, I'll just touch on that a little bit, and maybe we can all just – you know, pitch pitch in our experiences, but mine, uh, unfortunately, I thought I was going to have a better chance to give, because um, I did pick Chevy for my manufacturer for this last season, and I thought I'd be able to give Anthony more of a run because I was S and he was A plus, but it didn't work out. I just every time I tried to get into the game, I I couldn't practice or. Uh, excuse after excuse, and then the one time that I was all ready to go and set up, the fucking power went out. <laughs> So that was like the racing gods telling me, hey, chill, dude. Just <laughs> take a little break. It's all good. I think somebody tipped out. off Kaz. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Sent the PD overlords. <laughs> all powerful. 
Yeah, but how how did your guys uh, starting with Daniel? Uh, how do you how do you feel about your run in this last uh, off season? Um, it's a mixed bag. There, <laughs> I can't think of last season without thinking about the last Nations race where I literally lost uh, the potential to win just because uh, I was racing next to Def Sun going into the second chicane on the Molsan Strait and. Like, I was letting him go past, so I, I went to break, and he, like, braked a little bit early, so I kind of misjudged and, like, let off a little bit, but then I realized I was letting off a little bit too more than I, a little bit more than I wanted to, and I just went straight into the, uh, straight into the cut, and just, and then I got, like, Jeez. a half second penalty on the last lap, doing the exact same thing that Windfire did on lap five, and I got a penalty, and he didn't. So oh, I hate it. it's just a little bit of inconsistencies ruining my run because I just caught up to Windfire over the course of the entire race and finally got past him, and uh, I lost out. So I could have had second, and I dropped that. And the manufacturers, I mean, it's Alfa Romeo, dude. Like, I still think the Group Three car is an absolutely terrible piece of crap car. Uh, nobody can tell me otherwise. POS. I think once I transition to wheel tire wear, it won't be as big of an issue, but the way it is on pad right now, that car specifically, like, burns through front tires like nobody else. And the way it's set up, like the base setup, it has really, really bad understeer on high-speed corners. So there's a lot of tracks where it just gets really hurt, and it doesn't even have, like, That's any weird. top speed advantage to boot. It's just kind of a... It, now that the McLaren has come out, the F1 GTR, it just feels like a way worse version of the F1 GTR. <laughs> so it's like, why ever use it? So, right. like, that top 16 race, I didn't make it anyway, but even if I did, uh, and everybody else, I would have lost, like, three extra positions. So we kind of lucked out in a way where all the, the nation's people that made the top 16 didn't make manufacturers, and there were people in there that would have taken my spot because I would have done awful in that race. But Yeah, to fill people in on that, by the way, so there was this time... Uh, kind of issue where if you were doing the top 16 superstars race for nations you didn't have enough time or you only had like a few seconds to exit the lobby go back into the menus and to be able to actually enter the top 16 manufacturer race which is after like way too so they were stacked on top of each other way too closely and so what ended up happening was uh, the manufacturer top 16 was just vacant of most of the people that should have been in there. And yeah. I mean, there was Tristan was in there, which was great, and Armin, but you know, we were missing a lot. It wasn't a good race, it wasn't as good as it, it wasn't the culmination that anyone was looking for. Yeah, it well. was the culmination that Defsum was looking for because he got to uh, wait. No, it wasn't, it was not, it was the one Stagger was looking for because he took first place because of it. But no, uh, manufacturers. I can't even say that I did well because I ended up third place overall, but I also have the Alfa Romeo Group 4, and everybody can use that as a reason to say that I'm not good, so I'm going to accept that reasoning. Do you, okay. So do you, it, was, do you, it was okay. Are you hearing a lot of people say that you're not good? <laughs> no, I'm not hearing that. It's just you, you, can't, you can't do a Group 4 race without somebody complaining about tire wear. So if you win the race, you automatically know that everybody – doesn't think that you won that race they think that your car won that race I and so that. i i've kind of had to like live with that mentality to where like every group four race if i win i just don't feel like i earned that one f those people though dog f them right to the hell i mean i can't because they're kind of telling the truth i think if i were in a different car it would not be the case at all stop being so logical all the time all right tristan what are you what was your breakdown of your series? <laughs> I had a, a great championship. Um, I think I Citron! won. I think you did. What was your placement? Just okay. So just to recap really quickly, Daniel, you got third place in I got nations. third in nations and manufacturers. Which two second and then American or United States? Yeah, US, I was second USA? in the U.S. because Windfire was second above me. What? Like you mean you were second in the U.S. and you were third? In I was third overall and second in U.S. Right, and Windfire was first. Windfire was first in U.S. and he was second overall. And then winner, the winner overall was, was Defson. Yeah, right. Okay, Canada, Defson, Defson. 
Usa Usa. Okay. And then going over to Tristan, what were your placements? I was fifth in both. The Fernando Alonso pole position. Yeah. Pretty much. <laughs> You were like, you're like, I'd compare you to Alonzo. I think that's fair. And then Solis, I'd compare him, you know, to like, a, you know, uh, Narain Carthaking. <laughs> Hold on now. He's not bad at all. The difference between Tristan <laughs> and Alonzo is that Tristan doesn't ruin a team by existing. Oh, yeah. That's a good point. Well, I, I, <laughs> I think Alonzo just can't help it. There's some personality trait that just occurs, and it's just a matter of time. If you see the Netflix doc, the first episode, it's hilarious because during testing, he's like, is there a reason for these cameras? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he's just like the boss. Mm -hmm. So, oh, Great doc if you haven't seen it. Netflix F1. Yeah. Check it out. Very entertaining. So moving on, yeah, going back to your um, take on your series uh, in manufacture, off-season exhibition, blah, blah, blah. What I remember most specifically and poignantly is uh, following – um, Daniel all the time. <laughs> it was uh, a fast one. It was very difficult to keep up with these guys. Um, you know, particularly Dodge Lamb, uh, Def Sun, Windfire, just hauling ass all the time. And uh, I was pretty lucky to win in Austria in the Nations, I think, like uh, maybe round eight or nine, because uh, Windfire was in a beetle and uh, hauling me up in the second half of the race. Give it like another lap and a half, he would have. Um, probably overtaken me so you know i was i was pretty lucky a few races uh i didn't win you know nearly as often as i was expecting which is a very egotistical thing to say but the truth nonetheless um yeah it was tight man a lot of people showed up and showed up hard uh, like well let's go through some of the names that surprised you guys so for me like mr stinky bug even though i knew he was quick but he really stepped it up for this last uh season Stinky Bug is definitely up. one of those people. Stinky Bug has gotten a lot better. Like, I think Stinky Bug and I, like, I, I typically don't talk about myself, but I think Stinky Bug and I have made the same sort of progress between the end of last season and now. Because I think Stinky Bug has always been, like, just a notch below me. And I was, like, way below everybody else. And now that this off season has happened, I've kind of like progressively gotten near the top and stinky has kind of followed me along so he's still like a little bit under the top like maybe top five top 10 people but he's like really close because he's improved a lot over time yeah i would agree with that and for you tristan any names that jump out at you in, in the mind this is ridiculous <laughs> yeah ridiculous i think <laughs> I'm giving it my really best cool try. Though. I'm not a, yeah. you know, not a scientist of words. Or am I? Not a ridiculous person. For what it's he worth, uh, he plays under his, his DNA tag, which yeah, is I DNA underscore DNA until now. Uh, Ibisu. Ibisu. I, I assume that's how you pronounce it. Yeah, um, DNA is a great team. A lot of strong guys. And before I had known that was the case, my, my opinion of him was that in terms of, like, a top split race in North America, I, I would say, I would have always said that he was like between six and 10 position. And on his Abisu account, that's pretty much where he ends up. So if you take that like average in the middle for North America compared to the top of every other region, I think he did a really, really good job at this, uh, this manufacturer series Yeah. to actually win the whole thing as somebody that I would personally say is not exactly too close to that top level i think he did a really good job and uh, i'm very impressed with how he how he drove at the event yeah i would say he was the ultimate wild card story and he is going to world finals and that's pretty crazy he's he doesn't have to play gran turismo anymore until november <laughs> lucky guy lester was always there like at every no, I race i believe i believe they they uh went back on that statement that wasn't what was supposed to happen uh, what is that you're referring to the manufacturers like qualifying for the world final i think that's just for nations the uh nations oh winner. oh right right, right. yeah they retracted so. that statement ah so unfortunately <clears throat> he's not but he still has a good shout there's good motivation it's like confidence builder booster for yeah it's huge for sure 
and uh, I'm sure he's going to be strong and throughout this long, long, super long, extremely long season of <laughs> 40 races that we all have to compete in. We, Eddie, you pointed out how Kuda Man has shown up again. Oh yeah, Kuda Man was strong early on, but then I think he had you know other things he needed to tend to, so he wasn't able to really finish out the season. As, like he was, like he he intended to, I guess. But he was going strong right from the get go. Yeah, he's uh, so Kudaman is Brian Heikotter. He's the uh, very first GT Academy champion from the United States back in 2011, the year right before me. And super awesome guy, uh, an autocrossing legend. Uh, he ended up making a good name for himself in the uh, kind of like top level SCCA. Um, like racing series here in the United States, like the Pirelli World Challenge and stuff like that. So, yeah, I mean, he's had plenty of fun. He's got a great legacy, and he's still really fast in Sims. I, he's always been really fast because he's been playing Sims since, like, back in the uh, IndyCar days, like uh, com- on the Commodore and stuff. And <laughs> I remember racing him on iRacing. Or not, I wasn't racing him, but I, I jumped into an iRacing room. It was a Miata at Sebring, like, way back like 2010 or something and i couldn't believe how fast he was i mean just uh, to give you an idea in the last manufacturers off season we did there was three people in the top 15 that did five races or less kuda was 14th he did five races and he ended up in 14th place and i know yeah. that one of those was also really bad for the reno so that's good for him uh right above him in 13th was ant he only did four races and then in seventh or not seventh uh eighth place you had originals 14 who is uh five zygon yeah. he was in it's eighth Randall. place with yeah. uh with four races so really good t- for all of them across the board but that gives you a good idea of where kuda kind of sits i got a story about kuda man go ahead he uh he and i had a race i think it was uh dragon trail gardens in the group fours and he driving for Renault did a no stop and um, managed to win the race by like two or three seconds. Damn. Yeah. He pulled it off big time. Yeah. Those are, those no stops are tough, man. Uh, Like I did the no stop at Bathurst and I didn't plan it ahead of time. And I, I was just in the room and, you know, we were watching, that was the, weekend that it was it was a, it was a saturday so on saturdays they were um top 24 superstar races and their race I, we couldn't reference you know i couldn't watch that race and then try to do the same thing in my race because our race was shorter it was 20 minutes versus 30 so i remember um sorry ibrahim was one of the guys that couldn't that unfortunately didn't make the, the dr cut or whatever uh, to get into the top 24, so he ended up getting into our room. It was, and I was A+, plus, and so was Tristan, and Ibrahim was in there, and he, he had mentioned in the chat, no stop, question mark. And I was <laughs> like, huh, that must be the one to go for, because we were both in 4GT. So I went for it, and it ended up working out. But no stops are difficult. Sorry, I had to pat myself on the back a little bit. I don't know why I did that. Daniel, do you, but, uh, <laughs> Daniel have you, are you a practitioner of the no stop? Have I what? Would you He's say on the controller? He can't do no stops. Yeah, it's true. I guess. Um. <laughs> so, the only time I can get away with a no stop is in the Alfa Romeo compared to other cars in Group Four, and I there was a possibility of me doing it at Blue Moon Infield a reverse, but because of being on controller, my tire where it was just a little bit worse, and it was uh, it was at that point where it was just just bad enough not to be able to do it whereas i know other people like blazer r93 in europe he was able to do it and uh i typically don't like no stopping unless it's like significantly quicker like maybe five seconds or more because i don't like the the grip disadvantage that being on worn tires gives you especially in mr cars so like you can get a quicker time overall in theory but it also makes the race a lot harder and uh driving on worn tires is always like a risk factor and that's a risk factor i personally don't like i guess the only other situation where it becomes useful is if it allows you to dodge traffic but otherwise i like i like stopping 
more often than no stopping, only because I just like being able to drive the car. <laughs> it feels so weird when you can't push the car. Right. Like, I've done league races, like, uh, I know Pinnacle, me, you, and Tristan are in, and uh, there are situations where I've done a long, hard stint, and the longer it goes on, compared to a guy that's on fresh softs, it can be like six or seven seconds of a lap difference, and it just feels horrible to drive on worn hard tires. So, yeah, I like pitting, Depends. personally. I'm a, I'm a pit boy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a pit yeah, boy it's... wearing a pit boy with my pit bull. Damn. With pit cairns. And okay. pit bull singing in the background. Pit bull I singing think we'll the... stop there. With, with his armpits shaved. Okay. And he's Mr. Uh, Worldwide. And he's on a spit roast. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> All right. So, yeah. So that brings us to the other big story we have. Some, we have a little bit of information that we'd like to divulge to the uh, larger audience. And that is the overview for the 2019 World Championships for the FIA Gran Turismo. And so starting it off, uh, things are different this year. There's no regionals. Um, it's going to be a lot more strict as far as who's going to be allowed to go. There's less spots. It's more spread out. Uh, things are going to get extremely competitive on the sharp end of the uh, points table. But it is a very long series. So it starts... There are going to be four stages. The first stage starts this Saturday, the 23rd, uh, this following Saturday, so we are on our, we're on the 16th, so on the 23rd of March, round one, stage one starts, and that goes until the 27th of April, so 10 rounds, that concludes stage one, and then May 1st, the following week, it goes right into stage two, and then we go to stage three and stage four, which ends September 7th. So, the best 10 out of your 40 rounds uh, culminate, uh, you know, get collected at the end of the, of the massive mega season, and that determines who's going to get to go through to the World Finals, which are going to be in November, in a, in a location that's yet to be determined. And then, adding to that, there's going to be five World Tour stops. The first one just happened in Paris. Then if you go on GT Planet, you'll see where the other stops are. There's Paris, there's New York, there's Nürburgring, like last year. Then uh, we also have Austria again, and then Tokyo. So that's four. Which one am I missing? There's one no, more it's somewhere. Paris, Nürburgring, uh, New York, Red Bull, and Tokyo. Okay, those are the five. And... <laughs> People who win the Nations Cup get an automatic entry into the uh, World Final, but that also takes up a spot. One of the uh, three, was it? Uh, it's different per region. So there's 16 in yeah. Europe, uh, five in North America, five in Central and South, six in Asia, and four in Oceania. Yes. Well, for Nations Cup... Yeah, I'm looking at, it, at the sheet, and it's ten, maximum two per country as well. Which is oh, oh, we're talking about the uh, the World Tour or the World Final? Sorry, the World Final. The World Final is uh, it's five for North America and three per country. The World Tour qualifications are three for North America and two per country, and that's based on stage results. Right. So, if you do well on the stage, you have a slight chance of getting through to a world, a world tour stop. And so, world tours are going to be, like, best of the best. Would you say so? I would expect it that way. I mean, the best of people who have the time to invest in all of the races. Yeah, and that's a key tenant, because people are talking a lot about dedication, loyalty, like, what... Uh, PD is actually looking for in these in the selection that they're you know the criteria that they're going with it it really 
demands a lot of time and effort and that's definitely the idea right i would say so but on on that point i want to point out that stagger did the opposite and just showed up out of nowhere halfway through the manufacturer season and fucking won the thing that was amazing yeah he also didn't uh, he also didn't do the nation's top 16 so that had a big factor in it that's fair yeah and that's one thing that people are saying now with this the way that it's set up. I mean, we still don't know how the actual slots are going to be um, as far as time. We know they're going to be still Wednesdays and Saturdays, but we don't know if they're going to be you know spread out a little bit more like they were to the end, toward the end of this last off season. Um, so th- it might be the case where people are going to end up picking just one to go for. Right, that one being either nations or manufacturers, right? I suppose. Daniel? I'm sorry, repeat. I was totally distracted. (laughs) No problem. So I was just going off about how there may be people choosing to go one or the other rather than attempting both at the same time like we were doing last year. I think that could be the case, but in in my opinion, uh, if you want to increase your odds of getting into the... uh, the live events you you probably might want to go with both but i don't know it, it kind of depends um if i if i can get my thoughts together here i think after the mistake that they had with the timing on the top 16 races i don't think they'll make that mistake again <clears throat> i don't see why they would they might make the nations one happen at an earlier slot and then allow the manufacturers to stay at the same time so there's no massive conflict but i think they learned their mistakes Or they learned from their mistakes. So, it really depends on how you look at it. I think it's better to just maximize both. As opposed to just doing it in one. Mainly because... I don't know. It's a weird way of looking at it, but I just think that putting too much time in the one thing makes you burn out a lot easier, in my opinion. I don't like that mentality, so... Well, I think the difference, the key difference is that well, while we still don't have, we only have information on Nations Cup and what the criteria is for going through for World Tour and World Finals, we still, it's to be announced the criteria for Manufacturer Series. And I think the big thing is people are going to feel as if Nations is way too competitive because they're in a nation full of people rather than a Manufacturer Series where they may be able to select a car that not many people are going for and get in that way so I think that's a big element uh, or a big factor of why manufacturers was more competitive because you had people fighting you know to try to make their car a top 16 and now it's, now going into 2019 they it may be even uh, narrower the it may be a 12 top 12 or whatever I still think if you feel that you are competitive enough to qualify for these events, you should be putting more time into nations, if anything. Because with manufacturers, unless they have some divine plan to include all 24, 25 manufacturers, like unless they have a way to include everybody, you're basically playing a game of luck for which ones work and which ones don't. Because uh, if it's anything like last season, your individual performance could not matter at all if the rest of the world doesn't follow along with you. So I think Nations gives you the most surefire shot at just qualifying in terms of just yourself doing all the work instead of having to rely on other people. So if there are people that want to focus all their energy and effort into one series, I would definitely go with the the Nations because manufacturer sounds easier in theory with just you competing with people in your region to be the best in that region. But overall it could hurt you if you pick something uh not very popular like citroen or uh peugeot or even renault at this point (laughs) you just named three brands all from france yeah uh literally (laughs) the french manufacturers just don't get picked probably because they're bad but you know that's (laughs) (laughs) that's beside the point They need a little uh, power, (laughs) you could say. Oh, goodness. At this point, uh, Renault could use, like, 
ten percent power across the board. <laughs> just divide it how you want, like seven percent on the trophy and like three percent on the RSO one. Do something, but taking another power of the RSO one was the weirdest thing I think I've seen so far, like since the Alpha incident. I'm surprised more French people aren't getting out in the streets and protesting about this. You know, the French sure are contentious people, especially when it comes to. Okay, I don't want to offend anyone, but um. Hey, you know what? Yeah, we've we've French got people... some nice French people in in our uh, in our GT Sport community. Jomas? Joe Moss is the best. Joe Moss is fantastic. Hell yeah. Atho's a good guy. Yeah, dude. I like all those Frenchies. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, so let's, to give people a, more of a clear picture. So definitely follow along on the website. If it isn't out by the time this is published, uh, try this. Go to grand, grand, go to grand-turismo.com slash US or wherever you are. Then another slash GT Sport. Then another slash... <laughs> FIA 2019. Another slash detail. Though I'm sure if this video goes on YouTube like it probably will. Uh, maybe we should put a link yeah. in the description below. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead and point to the link below, Daniel. Great job. All right. I'm pointing down, but you just don't see it. <laughs> and technically, right, so because no I'm pointing down, I'm not pointing at the best spot. But we're pointing down. Yeah, me too. So... Let's come up with a scenario here, okay? Because World Tour stops, Nations Cup, if you win Nations Cup, you get an automatic golden ticket, Willy Wonka, all the way to the World Finals. We just don't know where those World Finals are yet. Could be Monaco, could be the moon. We're yet to find out. We don't even know if Kaz is going to wear uh, Willy Wonka's outfit, so it'll be a big surprise. I smell a GoFundMe. GoFundMe campaign. True. Fortunately, on that note, I will step away for a few minutes. No problem. We keep it I rolling. Apologize. That's what we got too. No worries, soldier. We're not leaving you behind. We're keeping this caravan pitted until you're back. No garbage GT players <laughs> left behind. <laughs> <laughs> so, the there is a scenario that could happen, right? There are only five slots, maximum three per country, for World Finals. For North America, there are 16 for Europe, and blah, blah, and so on. But speaking if specifically about North America, say that a North American wins, uh, and one of the World Tour stops. That means one of those five spots is going to get eaten up. Hmm. So the rest of the guys are going to have to get it through on points. So say Europeans and Brazilians win <laughs> the most of the World Tour stops. The and then maybe say, you know, Defson wins one of the world tours. Then there's going to be four spots to fight for for North America. And again, max three per country. Mm -hmm. And those spots are going to be uh, determined with points on the online stage. This is going to become blood sport. It's going to become extremely, extremely competitive. I look forward to it. It's gonna. It's a new I challenge. I look forward to it as well. I think a lot of people are gonna show up out of the woodwork, and but also that's gonna happen in the beginning. But it is a long four seasons, man. We're talking like six months of racing. Sweet. Yeah, every Wednesday and Saturday, lives are gonna change. People are gonna die. Okay, sorry, <laughs> not really. <laughs> I look forward to ind indulging the time in that championship. Me too. It's going to be fun. It's going to be nuts. And who knows how things are going to change and evolve throughout the thing too. Because we saw points change in the middle of the off season. Although I hope that doesn't become a thing later on. I think they're pretty settled on what they want to do. But um, yeah, we don't know what the combos are going to be like. If, they're, if Nations is going to stick to the usual, you know... Uh, kind of combos that they've been doing or they're going to do more experimental things, uh, keep us on our toes uh, I would welcome a, one of those super formula rounds, that would be great for sure that's coming to GT Sport soon, super formula in the form of two cars, one's Toyota one's Honda, right? Uh, um, it's going to have push that's the correct. pass yeah, they, oh, they will definitely sound different apparently so that's useful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Always good to have a race car that sounds like a hell. Sounds like great. Sounds like hellfire. 
Hell's Fire. Throwback. <laughs> Uh, yeah, this season is going to be very long, it's going to be very involved, and I think the family's just going to get stronger, we're going to be racing the same guys, and it's a, it's a pretty tight-knit community, we're still pioneers, man. <laughs> um, Mike Kim pointed out when uh, she was watching the manufacturer's um, round of the Paris World Tour this morning with me, that I was fangirling <laughs> over, like, <laughs> hey, there's Rich, oh man, there's... Um, I don't know, McLaren or something like that. Uh, there's Tichney, holy crap. And the drama that unfolded, it was just fun to be, um, I don't know. It, it was more immediately personal in the, uh, yeah. in its influence. It was like in one year we've gotten so attached, like even more attached than we have to, for example, Formula One that we've been following forever. Like, we're rooting for them harder. We're rooting for our guys harder than I, I root for Hamilton. It's pretty amazing. I was definitely more excited to watch that than I was F1 qualifying, as exciting as that was. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so no spoilers here, but yeah. It was it was not what I expected. But anyway, <laughs> yeah, the, these races, FIA, the Gran Turismo, Casanori, they're doing a st stunning job, and I think they started out last year with kind of a wide scope. They had a lot more players. They had those regionals. Their concepts were more kind of uh, inclusive, or they're, they were wide, you know, they had more people uh, that were getting shots at the at getting in. But now it's they're condensing. They've already kind of saw who their best drivers are, and they're sort of just saying to us, well, if you want it, you're going to have to beat these monsters. You know, we have the all-stars here and you're going to have to step it up if you want to, if you want to mess with us over here in all these exotic locations. Mm -hmm. So they, they've certainly created a, an intensely attractive carrot to chase and it's going to be, yeah, really competitive like you touched on. That's a really good way of putting it. Like it's a exquisite emerald carrot or something <laughs> yeah i don't know what just uh, happened but i, I guess it was <laughs> so oh to come up to come into that with uh <laughs> double pun intended man that's funny emerald hello carrots. where were we i'm sorry I, I feel like i'm in a brand new world well welcome you friends are. we call this earth <laughs> i thought you were gonna say america so i could like diss us or something I'm glad I chose oh, the former. Uh, I'll, just have to, I'll just have to diss Earth by saying Mars has much better... Uh... What does Mars have that's better? Well, Mars needs women, that's all I know. Better movies. I guess. Uh, Mars has... Uh, Mars is pretty far away from you, so that's a plus. Uh, Mars has Interstellar. No. <laughs> <laughs> I've never even yeah. seen that, so I'm probably wrong. It's a great movie, but so we're talking about the scope of, or the change that, you know, PD's, or Gran Turismo's gone through in regards, you know, when you compare last year to this year, it seems like they're going for more of a uh, condensed formula for their series going forward. They're, they're not, you know, spending as much money, uh, they're picking their guys that are their is they're their stars and they're saying we, we gotta beat him. I already repeated this. This is so I'm just saying it for your sake. But uh, what's your take on the difference between last year and this year, going forward? Their their approach. Okay, so hot take, right? Maybe they should have just done less world tours and done the regionals again because it just sounds like all all the money that they took from the regionals went into five world tours. It's it's the yeah. world tour year. We'll, we'll we'll give them that. Um, no, I think. Uh, I think that may actually have something to do with it. I think they're just trying out a new event structure with the World Tours. And uh, yeah. because there's more events, obviously they're, they're, they're spending less money per event by having less drivers. But I think in the long run, it's probably about the same, considering they're hosting more events. So compared to last year, it's just a, a shift in structure and how they're doing it. And to be fair, I actually do like the way they're doing it this year. I just think the... Uh, what would you call that? The inclusivity of uh, 
I don't even know if that's a word. I know it's exclusivity, but just having less drivers makes it a lot harder to get in. And I think that's going to hurt a lot for people that thought that they had a chance before, but feel like they might not now. Like, I know that I, I'm starting to feel that way because there's a lot of competition that's going to happen. I think people are going to come back and North America is going to get a lot harder. But it'd be nice if they could find a way to make it so that there's more avenues for different people to get in the world tours, but like not necessarily through some sort of you can only attend one world tour at a time kind of thing. It's just kind of tough right. because I feel like these world tours, if there's if there's like a defined list of people that are at the top of every region, they might just end up constantly going to world tours and nobody else has a chance. Which, yeah. when you look at it as a, as a competitive esport, it's not necessarily the worst thing in the world to have the best people going over and over because you, you want the best quality event possible with the strongest players. It just feels like there's a... Uh, there's not a lot of space here compared to other games, if that makes any sense. Yeah. The the way this season's set up makes it feel like there's way less of an opportunity for for different amounts of people to get in. It'll be interesting to see how it works out. But I've I've got this feeling that we could end up in a situation where literally the same people keep going to world tours and there's not much variation. I think I yeah, but I know what they're doing. What it's that? called the De Beers strategy, where they artificially uh, reduce um, participation availability to inflate interest. That is true. That could be a thing. We'll see if it yeah. works out. I mean, it, it might kind of backfire, but it depends. Maybe they're planning to release Gran Turismo Sport 7 next year or some title and uh, are counting on that to bring back players who might feel ostracized by this year's rules. Where'd the other five sports go? <laughs> <laughs> you little shit. But yeah, uh, I think I keep thinking, well, this is going to happen for a while. Gran Turismo and FIA Championships, they have a deal locked in until next year, right? I actually don't is remember it 2021? I think it was either 2020 or 2021. It'd be cool if they extended it. Um, that's totally yeah. That's the big point there. That's that's if, probably what this is well. all about. Really, yeah. We're this is the pioneering. These are the experimental years. We're gonna look back on these years and be like, man, these, they had it tough. Yeah, these but, are the uh, years. There, that, there's nothing uh, like it's gonna be in the future. These are the years that help determine if they want to stick with us or, or move on. I guess if you could, if you could think about it that way. Yeah, that's why if you do want a chance in the future, you gotta stay. You know, you gotta stay motivated. You gotta um, support the cause. You gotta tell people, tell your friends, tell your mom, tell the mailman to tune in to these races and try to get as many eyes on these uh, 4K HDR uh, super detailed 3D models of cars that we race around tracks. Yo, ten years into and... the future, no joke. Ten years into the future, they're gonna be people like that it. are playing this game. Everybody will be at, like, a Lightning Igor level. And they're going to be looking back on, on the very first season of FIA and being like, yo, who's this Dodge Lamb dumbass, and why is he using a controller in, in the regional <laughs> final? Like, how did how did a DS4 person get there? Like, like people are going to be so good at this game. And, and the worst part for them is they're not the OG like we are. We are the no, old we're guard. Super OG, dude. Mm -hmm. We were there since the very beginning. And we're going to yeah, watch down. it grow. It's going to be fun. And I think what uh, – so let's end this podcast on talking about what happens when you introduce uh, more like money and uh, prestige into a, an event like this. Because uh, starting this discussion off, uh, the point that was brought up by someone on the uh, one of our chat rooms was that uh, – Kazunori doesn't necessarily want this to blow up to the scale of a uh, PUBG World Final or a League of Legends uh, kind of million times to whatever purse that is. You know, that's everyone sees big money prizes as uh, like that's what gets people to think your sport or your uh, your game is a serious thing. It's like. No one really cares. Like, oh yeah, there's great drivers. We have Lightning. We have Igor. 
the, all they want to know is, oh, well, how much money are they winning? And you tell them, well, they get to go to, you know, uh, the FIA prize gala, and then you have to explain that, and you have to explain so much other stuff for them to really come to grips with what that means. Yeah. But Casanori doesn't necessarily want to go that direction. So starting with uh, Tristan, what do you think? Uh, how, what's your take on that? Like, do you uh, do you think that uh, introducing a huge purse kind of spoils things, or does it make things more competitive in, in a good way? Or it might be the case. I don't know. It, to me, it feels kind of uh, similar to when Formula One introduced, um, uh, like, a lot of teams to start to advertise. I think it was like 1968, and with sponsorships comes, you know, more investment and higher purses and bigger commercial rights and more prize money being the ultimate thing. And if it was just, uh, it used to just be, just be the venue that was providing the prize money uh, up to then. So, um, you know, it was it was less a focus about how much money you're going to make and more so the the actual event of racing. So it's, I, I kind of support his, his current position. Um, you know, I, I'm very familiar with um, other huge gaming scenes like League of Legends or um, uh, Super Smash Melee. And, um, I mean, those are gigantic, and they're a huge, awesome pool of talent that, uh, you know, it's just a huge amount of extremely skilled people. Um, but I think that, I don't know, the exclusivity of Gran Turismo kind of makes it uh, more of a dedication of, of time and investment. I think it's a game for people who take things just a little more seriously or something like that. Or that could be a, just a subjective interpretation. No, I would agree with you on that interpretation because right now there isn't much to play for. It's just kind of bragging rights. And it, these are the days that we're going to look back on fondly. And if, if money does come into play uh, in the near future, then we're going to start to see freaks that do nothing but play the game. And... They're gonna, their skill level is gonna be out of reach, and so, what's, what are we gonna have to play for? Uh, I do hope, uh, you know, to parlay this into some of the other news that was released recently. That being the Toyota series that's gonna be running along with the FIA series. So Toyota, if you do, if you guys are unaware, it has announced that they're doing a online championship within Gran Turismo. This is gonna be concurrent with, not, uh, it's not gonna be. Uh, you know, PD's thing or FIA's thing. It's just Toyota. They're doing their own tournament through the game, and that final is going to be in Tokyo at the Tokyo Motor Show. And so I'm hoping that although FIA will be the crown jewel of Gran Turismo, that um, this Toyota thing kicks is successful because then other series, other um, SCCA, uh, SRO, you know, who knows? They... They could start to look at these platforms and start to say, hey, well, there's still a lot of good drivers, you know, although they may not be able to get to FIA levels, so they can still put on a great show for us. And why not go into Gran Turismo, put on a series, and see what, what kind of guys they can, what kind of drivers they can uh, attract. And, and it'll be, you know, a whole different vibe. And that could be a great thing, too. That is awesome. Like a, 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 con a manufacturer um, genuinely contracted into uh, watching talent and uh, ultimately choosing someone. Um, hopefully, they're the first of many. Yeah, I, that really warmed my heart to see that news that Toyota uh, decided to do that. So I did want to touch on, uh, at least give my opinion on the the whole monetization idea, right? Yeah, for sure. So, esports e is an industry, right? And so, you know, industry is made with business. And esports, in, in a nutshell, basically is a form of business. And so, the, uh, the way it works within this is that, you know, esports is another opportunity for people to do what they love, right? And for a lot of people, esports is gives them an opportunity to do what they love for a living. And that's something that I've been chasing for a long time. It's something I know I wanted to do. Uh, initially, I did it with League of Legends, and I was near the top of the ladder in that game, but I just was barely not good enough. And I found out that I was good at Gran Turismo, so I decided to pursue this. And I know this is a bit of a hot take. I know some people agree with it. I know uh, a lot of people disagree with it. Um, 
but I think for something like this to sustain and grow and capture attention, there needs to be some form of gain involved eventually, whether it's through promotion, like, say, <clears throat> like GT Academy, where people ended up driving for real-life teams, or money, like people play for money, like a large prize pool. Something like that, I believe, would be maybe not necessary, may maybe not ever necessary, but it is a large step forward in promoting this specific esports esports industry because racing esports isn't very big right now, and I think Gran Turismo, with uh, how they did their first season, has the opportunity to grow. I think a lot of people are interested, but it doesn't ever really take off unless you bring enough money to make people interested in it. And when the money's there, the sponsors are there. When the sponsors are there, teams form. And when teams form, people get actually get paid to do this. And then people actually take it a lot more seriously. And you have a higher level competition. And when you have that higher level of competition, then you get viewership. Viewership gets higher. Advertising gets higher. And it's just, it spirals into an effect where everything comes full circle. And everybody's receiving money on all ends. So Sony gets, or Sony and PD get money for hosting these events. So that they're not just paying out the ass to bring a bunch of people here and play for a trophy, right? And so what I want personally is for this to turn into an economy where people play this game professionally, get paid professionally, or, or some form of some form of gain to keep it interesting and keep people interested in continuing to play, right? So I have more of a a financial view on it just because esports is kind of geared that way. Uh I can understand the people that don't want it to grow in that direction because it's it's kind of a wishy-washy thing to get into. But, you know, at the end of the day, we just want to do what we love. And they're a subset of us that, like myself, um, it's like, it's one of those feelings. It's like, either I could do this for a living and, and enjoy it, or I could just do nothing and not enjoy what I do because there's not a lot of opportunities for people like me. So, because I'm kind of a loser. <laughs> No, but I don't know. A lot I things. want this to grow. I, I, I want this to vibe. grow in from. that direction <laughs> because racing, like apparently, people are saying that motorsport is dying. I haven't really watched a lot of motorsports, so it's it's evolving. And and I get what you're saying. It's just it's hard for people to relate, um, especially in America. It's different. It's, yeah. it's seen as a, you know people look down on it or whatever. They just don't understand it. It'll get to the level where people will be much more comfortable about, about the perception of, of the sport being professional sport and all that. So it just takes time. And, it, and cult, different, cultural, different cultures um, take it differently, right? So uh, eventually we'll get there. And I, th I think it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's super admirable. And there's more than one way to uh, be involved in the industry of this uh, e-sport, motorsport, whatever. Uh, there's, you know, doing content. Yeah. There's being an actual player there's being a manager training uh writing about it, it it's just gonna get, all of that is gonna get bigger so whatever your passion is and yeah or sub passion you can pursue it and i think like we're still we're kind of like the early you know we're, we're like i said before we're like the mercury astronauts you know apollo's coming around the corner and that's gonna be great we're gonna have our moon shot and uh I'm going to be like 45, but that's cool. But yeah. I'm still going to have a lot of fun. <laughs> but that's exactly what I'm saying though, right? Is that, um, you know, Kaz wants, wants these events to be good for people that can get into it. And then it creates like a, like a good story for them. Right. But at the end of the day, it'll, it'll start to get to a point where going to the top and winning a trophy is less life changing than somebody, you know, somebody makes, like changes their life over something like this and to a degree it, it works in the sense that you've got a person like Igor Fraga who wins the world final and I'm sure he's getting uh, notoriety and he's getting noticed around the world but it could be more than that you know yeah I think so and it will be are you ready for uh, the Gran Turismo reality show absolutely man <laughs> hey, only if it's on MTV. Look, Ooh. look, PD. All we're asking is for you to genie us into rock stars. Exactly. Yeah, that's what I'm we hoping should, uh, for. No, put it on Viceland. 
<laughs> Vice could be cool. Just bleach. You just gotta bleach Tristan's hair and give him some contacts. I think he'd be good for that. Could be a great fit. We'll just put your hair in a, t- in a ponytail and shave your sides off. <laughs> be great, Daniel. We gotta market ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> give me a mullet. I'm sure. I'm sure the amount of hair that I got can make it work. Daniel, you know, it's confidence. All right. So that was uh, episode six of Grand Trees Bros. Thank you guys so much for joining. Uh, look forward to more in the near future. Uh, thank you, Daniel, for coming along uh, kind of last minute. Uh, it was really cool. You did, it was very awesome to have you on the show. I, th- I think we can do this again in the future as well. So. Hey, I apologize sure, to people for having very long statements and being kind of <laughs> redundant and confusing, but hopefully any of it made sense. I think... Uh, no, it was a lot better than I did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is it's, we're worn out, man. How much racing is going on this weekend? Jesus, uh, enough. Christ, not enough for you. I, I gotta, I gotta pay attention to that, and I gotta watch League of Legends, and I gotta practice. It's a lot of fun. Hmm. Well, thanks for coming That's on, fun. dude. It was nice to have fun. you with us. It's nice to be here. Kind of. He called me Daniel Lamb. <laughs> isn't that the name of a? Uh, isn't that the name of the character from Manhunt Two, the main protagonist? I've never played the game, but I just remember that name, Daniel Lamb. I don't know. It sounds kind of like a like something out of the Book of Mormon to me. Yeah, Daniel Lamb is uh, the protagonist <laughs> of Manhunt Two. Little tidbit for you. Really? Never relate me to a murder ever again. <laughs> <laughs> or do you Sorry. know? I mean, that'd be kind of cool. I struggle not to. That would suck, man. In some ways. To kill people? <laughs> Just a little bit. We went All different right. directions with that. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. Say goodbye. Peace out. Later. Later. Cheers.